Hello everybody, this is Mike, formerly known as Cynic Critic. I went ahead and got rid of that channel because I was way too busy with my life and it honestly just wasn't really worth my time, but I will confess, it's not like I never missed it. And I am thinking about maybe putting some of those old videos back from the past, but who knows. But let's get past that and let's get into what we're talking about. Love is definitely one of them. But the primary point of discussion is actually about a movie, a very, very good movie, one that helped shape me as a gay man. This movie that I'm going to be talking to you guys today about is Coffee Date. Now, I had a chance to interview the director of that film, Mr. Stuart Wade. The movie was made just over 15 years ago, right here in Los Angeles. The movie was shot at a now closed coffee shop in Burbank, and I had the opportunity to speak to Stuart at length. So sit back, relax, and enjoy this interview with me and director Stuart Wade on the 15th anniversary of Coffee Date. Take care. I'm glad that you're joining my meeting. I've been wanting to talk to you about Coffee Date for so many years, and I'm, I'm glad that your DP, Howard Wexler, has put us together so that, you know, we can communicate especially. Yeah. One of the questions I have about the film is, do you think that it has aged very well since the subsequent 15 years? Um, I mean, I think it's still a very fun movie. I think it holds up in that regard. Um, the culture, thankfully, has changed. I think, um, you know, straight men in general, I think, are, are so much less uptight about gay issues. Uh, right. I think that you know i'd like to think that you know my movie and other gay movies along the way uh helped pave the way for that but um but yeah now nowadays you know a straight guy being mistaken for gay you know they're like yeah whatever <laughs> Let's just don't do it, do it, you know? well, well right and one of the things i love about the film is that it's also a good time capsule because at that time that you shot it i believe you shot it in 2005 it was released in 2006 i mean Correct. This was a time where, you know, Facebook was still just basically like for college students and MySpace yeah, was the thing. I hadn't and, even heard of Facebook at that point. Right. And, um, you know, this was the days of like still, you know, blind dates and Craigslist. And I just I really was just just taken by that concept because one of my friends, he told me about it. And I used to work at a Blockbuster video, and we had got a copy of this with other TLA release titles like Boy Culture and Not Another Gay Movie. And Coffee Date was one of them, and I had heard of Wilson Cruz, and I knew Jonathan Silverman from Weekend at Bernie's, and I had seen Jason Stewart in Ten Attitudes, which we also had. I mean, I was the resident gay guy at our Blockbuster, and um, when I got my hands on Coffee Date, I was floored by it i'm like wow like this is this is stuff that happens in real life a lot and one of the things i think that the film has a very strong strength with and it does hold up well is it shows that gays and straights are very much alike in a lot of ways and it's okay to associate yourself with you know someone who's not exactly the same as you but much like that movie Flawless that had Philip Seymour Hoffman and Robert De Niro. I remember, I mean, yeah. Yeah, like how that kind of was showing the boundaries of how enemies can hate each other, but put into a circumstance, you know, they just have to put aside their differences. And I think Jonathan Bray and Wilson Cruz did a very, very good job with that. I mean, I know that it was a low-budget film, but it doesn't... It doesn't really feel like that because the quality and the nuances of the performances transcend what, you know, you have to have. You don't, it doesn't need to look big and flashy. It doesn't have to have glossy anamorphic photography or fast angles or silly music. It's the message. And I really like that. I mean, it's just, it's such a good film though. I really like Thank it. You. Thank you. Yeah. I, um, I'm still proud of it. You know, I, 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 I enjoyed making it and I enjoyed, uh, you know, we took it out on the road. We went to all kinds of film festivals around the world with it. And uh, mm -hmm. it, it was, it was just a ton of fun. It was, it was great. 
Now, have you ever considered, um, because I know that we still have, you know, a couple months left in 2021 and the film's now 15 years old, have you ever thought of or possibly going to release like a special edition Blu-ray? Are you going to try to, you know, have like a special showing somewhere here in L.A.? With like, you know. I thought about doing a, some sort of yeah re-release, um, but you know I'm not a tech person, and you know I would it would be such a project for me to uh, get the elements that I would need to to do it. Um, you know I wouldn't be able to do it myself, but I'd have to get all the elements back from TLA, and yeah. it would just be such a hassle. Um, I did think about it. I would, I kind of, I'm, I'm sort of torn. I, it, one part of me would really like to do it, but uh, it just, I, you know, I'm, I'm in pre-production on a new feature, and so I kind of like, well, probably should devote my attention to, you know, new projects, not spend, you know, I have limited time and energy, so can't do everything. Well, I understand that. I, I just figured I would ask, especially since the star Wilson Cruz, he has blown up with Star Trek and everything. And oh, I know. he has yeah. continued to be steamrolling with his activism and whatnot and getting all those elements put together and having to go back to TLA and whatnot. But I do want to know some things, though, because I've seen it so many times, the film. One scene that was deleted, and I'm wondering why it was removed, because I, I love it so much. Why was the scene taken out where uh, Jonathan, you know, or Todd rather, he's in the bathroom and the guy says, hey, this ain't a bathhouse, it's a coffee house, and he walks out. I wondered that. Um, you know, I don't remember. There were certain scenes that we really loved, but, um, you know, we felt it was important to have a really tight running time. Uh, we okay. didn't want it to, you know, it's a comedy, we want it to move along. So for pacing, we sometimes, you know, there were some scenes where it's like, it's really funny, but it's gotta go. It's just, we gotta keep it moving. Or right, like, you know, there's some dead weight here. We gotta get rid of it. Yeah, yeah, you have to be really ruthless. It's it's painful, I can tell you as a filmmaker, oh. to get rid of stuff, but, but you know, you have to sometimes. Now, when you guys were filming it, was it a, uh, was it, I mean, it seems like there was a lot of good camaraderie. Was it an easy shoot? Was there any, like, delays, you know, with, like, scheduling or, you know, getting, like, lighting equipment, clearances, anything? Um, the equipment and all was, was pretty easy. The, the hard part is getting everybody's schedules to align. Ah. You know, Jonathan Silverman, busy actor. You know, Deborah Gibson and, and Sally Kirkland, everybody had, you know, other projects they're working on. And so it was definitely a challenge to come up with, you know, a schedule that worked for everybody. Um, so there was quite a bit of juggling. And there were a few times where we thought we had everything locked. And then some somebody's like, oh, I got to go out of town that day last minute. Sorry, can we, you know, and had to rejuggle the whole schedule again. But you know, that's what happens when you're working with busy, talented people. Oh, yeah. And you had so many talented. I mean, yeah, I forgot to even mention Elaine Hendricks. I mean, I knew her primarily as being the evil high school girl Evian from Superstar. And I'm like, oh, Ev okay. I'm like, Evian's in this movie. How about that? And uh, my gosh, just uh, just like all those scenes with her and Wilson, you would really believe that they were roommates and uh, just God, just all that stuff, especially with Jonathan Bray and Wilson. I mean, just Wilson's timing is just impeccable. Yeah, I mean, he's so good. I, I, I love him to pieces. Um, now, me being new here to Los Angeles and getting to know the lay of the land, I am curious, the plaza that they all go to watch the movie before, you know, Todd has the bottle tossed at his head, uh, where was that? I'm really curious. It's still there. It's the corner of uh, Sunset and Crescent Heights. Is that where that AMC is? That's over there? Where there's you take? I don't remember if it's AMC any, or but yeah, there's on the second floor. There's a movie theater. That's the movie theater we had them coming I out. Of. I knew it. I thought that's what it was. And um, yeah. what would you say was the most difficult scene to shoot in the film? Boy, it may have been that one because. You know, we rented out that basically that whole area, that whole outdoor mall area, 
yeah. but we only had a certain amount of time. And then we also had to time, you know, we had, a, you know, it was actually my cousin who we had uh, throwing the bottle out of the car. Yeah. And we only had, those of course had to be fake bottles. You can't, you know, you don't want to yeah. throw a real bottle. Into that. So it was, you know, sugar glass or whatever. Uh, but we only had like two of them. So we had to get, you know, we, we only had two takes. We had to get it right. Um, so, you know, and it's always challenging when you're at the shooting outdoors at night, you want it, you know, it has to be lit, but you don't want it to look like it's you know, artificial. And uh, and then I also made the mistake, I don't know if you recognize me, I played uh, Jason Stewart's boyfriend in that scene. And I'm not an actor and I am, a, I am a director. And so I'm in the scene and I'm like, in there th looking at everybody as the director, not staying in character. And I, I actually initially had uh, lines, but I just, I was too, I, I couldn't deal with it. So I finally, I, I like gave Jason my line. <laughs> I'm like, I'm just gonna stand here. <laughs> but, um, but yeah, it was, I mean, it was still, it was a lot of fun, but that, that was uh, a bit challenging just because there were a lot of moving parts for there. Oh, absolutely. And uh, Jason just, I mean, just, you know, Mel Brooks once said that Paul Lind could read restaurants out of the yellow pages and you would laugh. And yeah, Jason's like Jay, very much so. He's like, okay, you're hurting him. I'm <laughs> and when he walks into when he walks into the office room, he's like, here you go and take the fashion disaster with you. I mean, how do you not laugh at that? That's great. But... Yeah, he Oh, go ahead. Sorry. No, I just say, yeah, he, he really brought so much to that role. Yeah. But that line, that, that speech that he gives, I use that speech to this very day when he talks about a stiff prick has no conscience. And would you believe even in 2021, I still know and have associates who still believe homosexuality is a choice. And oh, yeah, lots of people still do. I have to, I mean, listen, you know, people can believe what they want, but it's annoying when you know deep in your heart that whether it's a choice or not, however you want to deem it, it's always been there. It's destiny. It's what is going to happen. No matter how much you can suppress it, you can't run from it. No matter how much you try, it'll always catch up to you. That's how I feel. Not to go too far off topic, but... Um, that little piece of dialogue that Jason Stewart says, I mean, it is, it is like the essence of it all. And I love that fact, you know, um, that, that line in particular, was that his own line or was that? No, I, I, that's my line. I, I, I wrote it. Um, he did improv a little bit, but mostly, um, you know, it was around my dialogue. I mean, it was, it was all scripted. Right, right. Now, um, I do have a friend who is a major fan of the film, and feel free to say no comments on this. He's curious. The scene where, you know, they do the experimentation, was that, I mean, I know there's a deleted scene where, like, you can see feet and, you know, shadows of, like, a shirtless person, but was it always intended to be pitch black and in the dark, or was there ever, yes. okay. Yeah, I mean, when I was first writing it, I, I I started to write, you know, like a conventional sex scene. And then I thought, you know, this is this is a comedy. It's not, you know, this isn't like a sexy movie. It's funnier if we don't, if it's all played out in the dark like that. Right. And I mean, I kind of figured that, like, you know, with the tonality and everything, like this is not meant to be a sexy movie. This is not meant to be exploitive or sensationalized. I mean, it's very much, you know... I mean, I, I figured that's what it was. So, like, when that scene was done and he's like, how much of that bottle did you have? I mean, what did you guys do, like, in editing? Just switch it to an all-black frame or something? Or did Howard yeah. actually turn the lights off? I mean, we did have the lights off, but, then, yeah, at some point we faded to an actual black frame. Yeah. Now, speaking of the technical stuff, I know you said you are not a big tech guy, but um, I, <laughs> I even asked Howard, I think. I mean, because the, the photography that was used, was that... Like, was it shot like digitally? Was it shot on film? Do you remember it all? Just shot digitally. And then uh, it was actually, we, we did a film uh, transfer. We transferred it. So it, it was shown on film in theaters, okay. Okay. but we shot it digitally, which um, was kind of unusual at the time. Now, yeah. you know, everybody shoots digital, but at the time it was kind of new. Uh, 
Oh, absolutely, yeah. And I mean, in 2005, there was a handful of films. I mean, in 2006, Superman Returns with Brandon Routh was coming out and Newton Thomas Siegel was just using the first Panavision's Genesis camera. So, uh, yeah, that's amazing that you were kind of ahead of the curve, you know, by shooting all digital. And yeah, um, I, I actually have never shot on film. I, I, I was starting right at a time when digital was coming in and I just never learned to, you know, just digital always seemed like the way of the future. So I, I never even shot anything on film. Well, it makes more sense anyway, you know, because you have to, you know, might have to go back and forth between takes and you don't want to waste anything, you know, and, and digital. I mean, it's just it's just space. It's just data. Once you had done your short that you did in 2001, the 17 minute short, I read you won an award for that. I won several awards for the short oh, film. Yeah. yeah. I don't like that. <laughs> um, it, it was the success of the short film that really let me believe in myself enough to to do a feature. Because uh, it's a big deal to, you know, just on your own, do your first feature. And um, but, but yeah, the, the short was so well received that I, I felt like I could go for it. But um, as someone like myself who is, you know, trying to get into the industry, um, that had to be even tougher 20 years ago, trying to get that equipment, get those clearances. And, you know, it's not like you could just get on social media and just be like, oh yeah, you know, blah, blah, blah. Let me find an actor. I mean, was the process much more arduous and difficult? And was it hard to find a distributor at the time? Um, you know, it's very different now. In some ways, it's it's certainly easier. I mean, the equipment, you know, you can now rent incredible cameras for next to nothing. And, and yeah. you know, it's, the equipment end is so much easier. easier. Aesthetically, yeah. Um, it, it's probably, I don't know if it's any easier or harder in terms of finding actors. It, it's still, you know, getting like talented uh, name actors is still, a, you know, a challenge when you're a new filmmaker. Um, I think getting distribution may have been easier back then because now, uh, you know, there's no longer, it used to be that, uh, you know, there were there was DVD and even, well, I guess VHS was already gone by then, but the DVDs were still very strong. Yeah. And um, so we actually had a lot of, uh, a lot of distributors interested in Coffee Day. Um, we had multiple offers that we got to choose between which was a really nice position to be in for a new filmmaker. Um, that is really, you know, these days, if you don't get into Sundance, if you're not one of the sort of top rank, then you're, you know, you're going to really not, I mean, my last film, we did have an offer from a distributor, but it was, you know, there's so little upfront money that I just decided to self-distribute. And, and it turned out to be a good thing I did because it's done very well on Amazon Prime. But um, yeah, it's just, it's a whole different world now. The, the market for down the road is, you know, and, and getting into theaters too. It's like um, nowadays, it's very hard to get into a theater with an indie film. I could understand that. And I mean, it. I would say, you know, it's, it's kind of like how like I just said, like aesthetically, like people can get the equipment, the microphones, all that jazz. But yeah, you know, when you have such an explosion of content these days, especially with streaming services. Exactly. And, There's so uh, much out there. Right. And now the pool, I don't want to say the pool is, you know, saturated, but it's it's just like since there's so much more exposure and it's easier to obtain exposure, it is tougher to have someone grab your product versus somebody else's because so many people can do it and it's just a race to see who can do it faster and that can be tough you know yeah and uh, it, yeah it's just it's very hard to distinguish yourself in the marketplace you know there's a lot of people that can just churn out kind of crappy product but they, they do it fast and it looks you know you've got cute boys in it what you know whatever and so you know it it's it's hard yeah it's it's can be difficult now when you guys had shot that short in 2001 was it shot like over the course of a week a few days do you remember it all gosh it was um i think we shot it over two days 
It was either two or three days, certainly no more than that. Yeah. I see, and it was shot in the same coffee shop that was featured in the uh, the feature length film as well? Um, did we use the same one? I think... No, we, we didn't. We ended up having, we went back to them. We wanted to shoot there again. And um, they, they were still in business, but they uh, they had kind of gotten burned, not by us, uh, but they'd had other film crews in there that had kind of trashed the place. And they're like, nope, we're not doing that again. And I said, well, you remember, we were one of the good ones. We, we you know, they're like, yeah, but yeah, we don't need the money, whatever. So oh. we ended up getting a second place. Yeah, which we worked out fine. But yeah, we ended up having to go with a different coffee house. I see. And um, it wasn't. I know I'm asking a lot of these like probing questions, but uh, was it was it hard to like wrangle up the extras and stuff like that for the coffee house or for the uh, you know the shopping mall scene? Or whatever? Yeah, I mean it's always a, a bit of a challenge uh, when you don't have a lot of money. You know, if you if you're willing to throw money at people, then you can get crowds. But when you're just like, hey, show up and help me out for free, <laughs> yeah. uh, it's harder. Um, so yeah, that, that's kind of always an issue with low budget projects is getting enough extra extras. I see, and the uh, entire shooting production for the actual movie itself, it wasn't too long or anything? That was, I, I think we did a 21 day shoot. Oh, very nice. Yeah, which I mean, it was challenging because it was my first feature. Um, right. Now, my, like my next one, we're shooting 10 day. 10 day shoot, so, so um, I've gotten a lot faster. Right on. I know what I'm doing. <laughs> yeah, and, and, and did you guys actually shoot in LAX whenever uh, Jonathan Bray is waiting for his mom? Yeah, well, that was actually LAX. I was really surprised they let us shoot there, but um, wow. uh, yeah, somebody said, you know, it's not as hard to get permission as you think. And so we, we found the right person to ask and Sure enough, you just, you know, you have to get a permit and you have to, I forget what we paid, but it wasn't as bad as you would think and uh, worked out great. Yeah, I was, I, I was amazed we were able to do that. I understand. And um, one of the things that's especially great about the film is it doesn't have a conventional ending. You know, with films like this, typically you'd think, oh, okay, the straight guy realizes what he really is and they become a couple and they don't. I mean, it's yeah. so important that this goes beyond a typical Hollywood ending. They live happily ever after, but they're not loving happily ever after, if you know what I mean. Right. I mean, they're they're yeah. they're friends, and they both come out of it changed, and I love thank that. You. Oh, thank you. Yeah, yeah. You're welcome. That was always the planned ending from the start. Was it to to be like? That? Yeah. Um. I mean, I, I guess it crossed my mind that you know I could do the conventional Hollywood ending, and I thought you know, that story's been told. You know, I I, I want to, and really, the, for me, the one of the goals of the movie was what you said. You know, to show that, you know, there really isn't this unbridgeable divide between the gay world and the straight world. That we really, you know, our common humanity uh, is more than enough to bridge it. And so yeah, I, that, I wanted that to that to be the end of it. To, you know, they they were friends. They were going to be part of each other's lives, but not as romantic. That's very, very beautiful. It is a bit of a personal question. Um, is, or I mean, you don't have to answer this, but is Jonathan Bray gay or is he actually no, a straight, he's straight. man? Yeah, he's, oh, he is. yeah, he's a straight man, yeah. yeah. That, that makes it even better. So like, wow, like this, it was almost like life imitating art in a way. Well, I mean, yeah. I'm sure that Jonathan Bray's a nice guy. He's, he's, he's a, a very, very nice, guy. very nice guy. Right, he's, yeah. not, he's not the jerk like, well, he wasn't, a, you know what I mean? Like he wasn't as apprehensive as, you know. Yeah, but he, I mean, he's an incredibly nice guy, but he's a straight guy and he's, you know, not like kids these days, like, you know, 20 year old guys, you know, they'll, they'll kiss each straight guys, they'll kiss each other just on a dare. But for him, like having to make out with a man, that was like, that was the thing. I mean, he had to kind of psych himself up for it. And, you know, he did a great job, but it was, you know, it was kind of a, a, a big moment for him. And that, that um, was that done in one take or was that? Multiple? No, we did multiple takes. <laughs> oh. Yeah. Um, I mean, we didn't yeah. do it. I, I, I wanted to be respectful. I wasn't gonna like make him do it over and over, but right. but I also just, you know, you gotta be, make sure you have 
what you need in the editing room. So yeah, we we did like two or three takes. I understand. Yeah, because I mean, that you know, it's like if I had to kiss a girl, you know, me being a gay guy, it's like. Mm. But then, well, actually, no, that's not. I know you. You know, what I mean, like that's not as difficult because it's not. You know, no, it doesn't go against the cultural norms, but it's still. Of course. Yeah, I mean, yeah. I got you. So, um, in closing, talking about coffee date, um, what is, or what was rather, whenever you were making it, like, you know, because every director they have a goal in mind, like. They, they want audiences to be excited or if it's to make money. Was this a film that was meant to, you know, do, you know, gangbusters at the box office, make a bunch of money? Or was this something well, to get, well, I mean, natural. You always hope for that. I mean, well, you know, yeah. but no, that was not the, that was not the motivation. Okay. Um, it really was what I talked about. I, I really wanted to make people laugh and create something that would bridge the divide. You know, because they're, they're, especially back then, I think, you know, a lot of times gay people, you know, lived their separate kind of ghettoized lives and didn't really interact a lot. And straight people, you know, they, they have their gay relatives and their gay co-workers, but, you know, there really wasn't a lot of close friendships between gay, especially between gay men and straight men. And um, I, you know, I wanted to show that that, that is possible. I, I have a very close friend who's a straight man and uh, this isn't our story or anything but uh, but I just I wanted to show that uh, you know that it can be done gay, gay men and straight men can, can hang out can be friends. I understand yeah because that scene in particular where the bottle gets thrown and it strikes Todd um, there was a situation that believe it or not very similarly happened around me and a group of my friends in 2007. Oh, wow. I was living in Orlando, Florida, and we have a paid highway called the 408. And past downtown, there's a winding sidewalk in the streets called Tam O'Shanter. And my buddy Dave was having a Halloween party, costume party. And me, and Dave and a couple of other friends, they worked at Target. I was a Little Debbie vendor and uh, I was the receiver, or no, my friend David, he was the backdoor receiver, well, more ways than one, but anyway. Um, <laughs> he, uh, he was the backdoor receiver at the Target on McGuire and Colonial Drive. And um, I used to bring Little Debbies and stock them at that Target. Well, anyway, uh, we were all going for a walk, me and him and you know some friends. And while we were walking, this guy in a pickup truck, he shouted out faggots and he tossed a full bottle of Mad Dog 2020 and it missed us and it shattered, I want to say, six feet from the sidewalk. And we all like jolted back and we even fell on the sidewalk. I mean, it was like, what the hell was that about? Like, what gives it away that we're gay? I mean, we weren't even, you know, we weren't dressed up some kind of way. We weren't you know, sashaying or swishing. We were just a group of people just walking, walking down the street. Yeah, and it's just like, I, and then seeing that part, it really, you know, was like, whoa, like deja vu. Cause, uh, you know, a lot of people I think today, they can say that they're cool around gay people. Like a lot of straight guys can say that, but a lot of straight guys, they can, or not just straight guys, but just straight people in general. You know, when you look at, like, audiences, for example, when I went to go see 28 Days Later, the film opens up with Killian Murphy laying completely naked, static shot right above, penis showing and everything. Even girls were like, ew. But the moment a female shows up, even halfway naked, even girls go crazy. I mean, yeah. it's, it's annoying, these double standards that we have, and... You know, back to the whole thing about people having acceptance. I think a lot of guys, straight guys, they will nowadays say, oh yeah, I accept gay people, they're cool, whatever. But when they're not around someone who is gay and they're around their straight friends, then they're going to talk about, oh yeah, these faggots, blah, 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 blah. And saying a bunch of stuff about gay people and saying, oh, this is sick, this is gross, I can't believe they do this. But the moment you go around them... 
that's when they chant, oh, hey, buddy, what's good? How you doing? Oh, you guys doing okay? I mean, it's, it's very much kind of like how racism is. It's not as direct. It's not underground. Yeah. Yes. It's, it's not socially acceptable anymore. anymore. I mean, it's the, it's, it's the same mannequin, just a different seasonal outfit. That's what it is. And that's why I'm glad at the end of the day that Coffee Day was a film that, again, it bridged that gap. And I think if more people could be educated and more people especially can see this film above all else, it will definitely help ease that pain because a lot of people who have curiosities, they need to see some kind of proof. They need to see some kind of example. And this is an example. And I think you made a very good example with your wonderful writing, your great directing, and best of all, your choice in casting. Well, thank you. Thank you. You're very welcome, Stuart. So that concludes my interview with Stuart Wade. I hope you enjoyed it as much as I did making it. Thank you for putting up through the technical glitches through Zoom. But at any rate, I hope you guys really liked it. Check out more interviews. I have a phone interview, actually, that I did with co-star in Coffee Date, Mr. Jason Stewart. So be sure to be on the lookout for that. It was a phone interview, so I'll try to do my best to integrate some images and videos through the discussion and not keep it so black and white. Anyway, thank you guys so much. I really hope you enjoyed my interview today with Stewart. Be sure to check out the movie Coffee Date. It is, like I said, now 15 years old. You can find it online, on Amazon. I believe it's streaming as well. It has Wilson Cruz and Jonathan Bray. I hope you guys really like it. Thank you for checking out this video, and I'll see you guys later.